Thank you very much, John, for your stimulating presentation. Now the floor is open. Uh, Vittorio is the first, and then uh, Paolo, and then uh, everybody. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much, John, for a fascinating presentation. I want to a little bit focus on what you said at the beginning of your lecture, which I think is extraordinarily important. The science of legislation of Bentham is not the first project, because in Italy we had Filangieri who wrote the famous Scienza della Legislazione. It's a project that gets out from the European Enlightenment. Today we tend to belittle the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment had something grand. It was based on a universalist ethics. It brought about the transformation of the legal system that before modernity was a legal system privileging certain groups, to the idea of the equality of the law, and it was building up on the evidence in the natural and social sciences. This combination of the two brought forth one of the greatest eras of Europe's politics, of world politics, because it allowed to increase life expectancy, to increase wealth in a way that had never existed before in humanity. And what we are witnessing in the 20th century is the slow erosion of the intellectual presuppositions of a project of enlightenment that starts in the 18th century. Um, and I want to explain in which sense the erosion takes place and why this is so extraordinarily dangerous for our time. One important aspect is, of course, the very strange transformation that occurs in the 20th century with regard to epistemology of ethics. Now, people may think these are very abstract philosophical issues, they have nothing to do with reality, but alas, it's not so. If you believe that values are ultimately your subjective opinion and nothing else, that to speak about objective values is completely idiotic, this will have consequences for our behavior. And it's completely naive to assume that the progress brought about by um, a human society in the 19th century has overcome what we are. We are ultimately little swines that have some glim of a moral principles that can help us to control our inner swine world. That is what we are. And in the moment in which we say, but there is no such star, uh, the famous uh, metaphor of Kant, that there are two things that fill him with awe, the stars in the heaven and the moral law within him. When we close the windows to that, we see a brutization of people thinking only how they can satisfy their private interests and nothing else has remained. Second step is that through all the nonsense of radical constructivism, we have arrived at the idea that even about facts, there is no real knowledge. That everyone can create his alternative facts because all facts are construction. You can show it in detail how this, for example, was already very important in the presidency of a second Bush. Uh, that some of his advisors said, there are no facts, we create them, um, and all this is done. And once you have given up that there is an objective moral law and that there is an objective truth, concerning both the reality of nature and the reality of the social world, politics is nothing else than a power struggle of who gets a get greater chance to fulfill his swinish interests. I mean, there's nothing else but what has remained. And now I come to the second part of your lecture. I completely agree with you that the church has an extraordinary importance in this situation. I think it's an experience that many of us had. Some of us do not come from a traditional Catholic background. I can tell you my own personal story. I was baptized as a Catholic, but my father was dissatisfied with the church, and I was raised as a Protestant. So, I, I, well, um, uh, there are some advantages with regard to Protestantism. You become very well familiar with the Bible, and you have a very, very strong aspect of personal responsibility. But the dissatisfaction of what you saw around you with regard to a liberal attitude that confuses the classical liberalism based on moral principles with the satisfaction of self-interest was a very important aspect to return to the Catholic Church. But what is clear is that the Catholic Church itself must be the heir of the true substances of enlightenment. And this means they must show respect to the results of science, and that therefore the pontifical academies are so crucial, and it must recognize that the universalist transformation of the moral philosophy and the legal system 
that it began in the 18th century was something positive which fulfills the will of God. And if the church can do that, then it can indeed inspire a new form of the science of legislation, which means based on moral principles that we will not have in the past. Can you agree with this very short yeah. telegraphic? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I've got the gist Thank of you your analysis, you. yes. Uh, I, I, would also, I would also look at the processes and procedures that have created what you describe. And for me, it is this replication of the contract world, which is that you have free, free will two equal parties. That's the mythology of contract. Free will entering a contract to engage with an outcome. And this is um, systemic to the way in which intellectual life is led. That what I think has happened is the moral issues that intellectuals are free, in theory, to talk about. They no longer, in my experience, talk about. And I think the most dangerous part is the law schools being degraded into, for no other word, but factories producing um, an engineered outcome for a certain amount of money with a profit obviously calculated in the amount, but with no sense of ethics or, more important than just the ethics, no sense of the responsibilities that go with the job. Now, having said that, there is some hope uh, pro bono work is more popular than ever because many lawyers find that as a way of mediating the injustice that they have to live with. And in addition to that, the formal courts are so expensive that none of us in the room can afford to use them, so therefore mediation has become a more popular way of dealing with things. Now, I think that's a key point. Mediation, I think, has got so much potential because it opens up dialogue. It allows people to talk to each other in a structured environment, admittedly, but to look at the inequality that is at the heart or the, the sense of injustice which is at the heart of the dispute. Now, here's the point. There is a way one can capture that in terms of creating a more moral society. It comes from that sense of need and necessity as much as from the intellectualism which should accompany it. So I, I, I think we're along the same lines. Thank you. Thank you. Paolo and then Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, John, for um, a very interesting, very balanced uh, paper, which is, I, I, I really appreciate. Um, two, I have two thoughts about the nature of legislation today and how it might be different, and I'd just uh, be interested in your reactions to. So the, the, the early tradition of legislative science as a method of reform that you referred to in the 19th century, of course, was prior to the advent of the administrative state, right? I mean, legislation starting in the mid-20th century looks nothing like legislation looked like in the 19th century, in part because legis the legislation itself doesn't actually even try to govern anymore. It tries to defer governance. It's, this is part of, it, it entirely fits with the narrative that Margaret was giving us this morning of centrism and a technocratic, bureau bureaucratic sort of character. So can, can we have legislation that even plausibly aspires to the kind of grand ideals um, when f primarily what's it, what it's doing is creating administrative structures that are completely depersonalizing the process and implementation of law. Um, so that, you know, what in the United States is, I'm sure you know, you know, what the courts do is basically say whatever the administrative or, uh, entity says is the proper interpretation application of law, we have to defer to, right? So the, the, the primary forum of principle is one that simply says the only principle that we have is the efficiency of deference to the administrative state. Now, tending in the other direction though, there's a, you know, aside from legislation as the science of efficient transformation of society, there's a different tradition of thinking about legislation that is even older than Bentham, um, which is more prevalent in the civil law tradition than in our own, but nevertheless is, 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 you know, goes back to uh, very far, um, which is the tradition of legislation as a form of pedagogy, right? Uh, and law itself as having a pedagogical role, less of an emphasis on the practical efficiency of the exercise of power, 
and more the way that legislation helps to educate a society about what's truly valuable, not necessarily expecting that the, the machinery of the law will then realize those things, but will help to tell us what we ought to value. And if you look at something like the Civil Rights Act in the United States, it, it had its effect much more through pedagogical influence, I would, I would submit, than through the actual machinery of the law. Or more recently, something like you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, since we were talking about the disabled, has had a huge pedagogical effect on the consciousness of the American people with regard to the place of the disabled in society. So might that be something else that we might capture? Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, in the first issue about the Minister of State, you know, Dicey in 1885 could deny draw administrative because they didn't accept there was administration on which the law would be administered. I think we have a curiosity that is distinctly English that we resisted accepting the administrative state until very, very late. You're quite right, it was found in other parts of the system, but it's defined differently. And the very fact it's defined differently goes to the way allocation of powers took place, primarily in local government, because that's where most of the power was. The idea of a centrist state is really a, mis a myth. Most power was with local authorities, and local government was powerful for magistracy, for adjudication, for all the rest of it. The bundle of licensing and regulation was done by local JPs, not by the central state. So I think that we were late to the table on that. Well, your second question, which is excellent about pedagogy, I recognize it, believe it or not, in the Human Rights Act. And that's why I didn't include it in my talk, because I wanted to try and avoid going into the debate about it, because at home, if you mention human rights and you question its viability, they think you're on another planet. The reason I question its viability is because it has not delivered what it promised, in the sense that it's not made it that much easier for people to litigate cases, which is what the expectation of those that wanted it. And the reason it didn't was, I think, that to a large extent, it tried to change the culture of the judicial system and me as a public body, as an administrator. I don't think the university's ever been taken to court on the Human Rights Act because we're compliant. We've been educated how to do it. And, and that's a very important tool. Now, the problem is, how do I statistically show this? It's a very difficult subject. And I think it's this, that. I wish we could have this conversation in Gray's Inn uh, or in the Middle Temple or with the Supreme Court present. I really do, because I think they're not, they are aware of the questions and they will articulate them differently, but they're not listening to what we're saying. And that's, that's something I don't think you should underestimate. The way in which disciplines have been bunkered and the way in which there's lack of conviviality. Okay, we can be, we are all socio-legal. We're all cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary. But that's a few, not the many. The one moment it began to happen was under this curiosity of Magna Carta, where people started to talk to each other about actually what did Magna Carta mean, and it exposed history as not being what they thought, but most of it myth, that you got the discussion. So the two points you make, the administrative state, excellent, I agree with it, I identify it. Um, Stanley the Smith, you know, started our discussion, and that was the first, was it 1950s, 1964, first textbook. Uh, and uh, human rights would be my example to you. So I do think that that's a very helpful uh, comment. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. if I'm taking too much time answering. Thanks. Yeah. Douglas and then Louis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, that was great. Uh, actually, Vittorio captured uh, some of what I wanted to say, but I'll put a little different spin on it. I was struck uh, early on when you were saying that what brought people together in, that in the uh, pursuit of legislation, in the debate about legislation, the commitment to evidence has yeah. actually brought yes. people yeah. together. And so one of the effects of the um, post-truth uh, yes. alternate yes. facts is it further polarizes. So we were polarized to begin with, which led to that, yeah. but it's a further polarization. Yeah. Yes, I think it's a good point to make at this moment because I feel very strongly that um, where does one get the evidence? The very question is itself an understanding of how dangerous it is not to have it. But what strikes me is how much more improved um, the House of Lords and the House of Commons, the Constitution Committee, the EU Committee, they are doing splendid work. They get no publicity, but it's one of the few places where you can be cross-examined to prove your facts other than the court.
So they've adopted forensic evidence. I wish they were more sociological. I wish they had more toolboxes in which to look at. But you can only get what you get. I mean, they have a limited budget, they have a limited sense of culture and so on. But the opportunities are there for anyone to put evidence in, including the church, including different parts of the church. And I think that one of the issues is all the churches ought to be more involved in this discussion because it affects them. It affects the moral conscience of the world, of the, of the nation. And, and it's not going to happen that they will be asked on the way out to turn out the lights. The light will be turned out by somebody else. So it's very important. So I like your question. Thank you. Oh, Louis. Let's say very then simply Trump. that I am very impressed with your paper. It's uh, very well documented, erudite, and very well written. Uh, maybe I'll take you a little bit away from the paper in my question, but before that, I'd like to read on page eight, Britain struggled to find a common intellectual framework on which to set the boundaries for law and policy. Yeah. Uh, and then you go on quoting many authors, mostly European, but it, it, it's very interesting, not only from, from Britain, but from Germany, and, and even, uh, I, I'm fairly well impressed, you go back to Auguste Comte et, et Montesquieu, oui. uh, which had oui, a great oui. influence, in fact, on yep. all this. But uh, in fact, uh, Britain has been a member of the common market, as we used to call it since 1975. Too. And, uh, of course, your paper is national legislation. Yep. But as a member of the common market, of, of the European Union, uh, I'd like to know how you consider the European legislation yep. as being highly or not highly relevant to your concern. Yes, I, I, I toyed with the etymology of the word and so on. I, I thought, well, in this gathering, I thought a UK Anglo-Saxon approach was suitable, but you're quite right. For me, um, it opened up three things. The fact of conceptually thinking about things in a different frame than I had from my experience as being a common law person. And that is very, very enlightening because you take the Water Framework Directive, for example, uh, the way in which it was drafted, the teleological way in which it's incorporated by courts, the way they interpreted, I think that was both informative but also liberating. So my first point is, our judges learned a great benefit from this by learning how continental judges, as they were called then, interpreted these rules, codes, and so on that they had not interpreted before. And I think it was a two-way process. Right. Secondly, and here's the good news, it's so em emboldened us that we will never lose it. In other words, it's this business about uh, discussing um, multiculturalism uh, or interculturalism. We as human beings learn from each other. And the French and the German uh, colleagues have taught me how they think. Uh, and in that respect, that's a liberating moment because you enter the mindset of how different cultures and different ideas are assimilated, prioritized. And I think our judges have done that. But thirdly, and I think it's probably true with uh, Jeremy Waldron and people like that who have, have, have lit up the legal stage by taking philosophical discourse and making it available to ordinary lawyers. And that is something that's exciting because it also brings the North American part to play. So in a sense, we have a better toolbox, more depth, more intellectualism than ever before, but there's a fear about using it. And it's because the British obsession with not understanding Montesquieu is the truth. They think it's about separating politics from law and law from politics, but we know it's not that. It's about, that's an institutional separation. What we want is a divinity that borrows from each with a cognitive understanding and support that brings us to the next stage of the enterprise. And that requires great courage as well as understanding. So I love your question. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Lord teaches, that's uh, Abe Lincoln who said that. 
And uh, the sort of extreme teaching of the law in a moral sense is human rights, uh, which have become uh, extremely uh, important, should one say, after 1990, in, in, in also in Europe and so on. Uh, we did, uh, I was in a study of legal culture in Norway, and we, there was interviews of judges. Uh, and they were all completely positivistic about every aspect, including human rights law, of international law. They said, oh, you, we must obey international law because it is ratified. And when they asked, but if law is just politics with a time lag, just whatever some politicians decide, why should you, uh, in a way, obey human rights law? Because that is even postulated to be something else, something non-political. And they had never really thought about this, and they just kept saying, well, it's politicians have ratified parliaments, have ratified these treaties, and therefore we as lawyers ob ob obediently sort of uh, uh, implement them. So this, this is a contradiction in terms of major proportions, this pos legal positivism and this tremendous support for human rights as something different from yes. uh, politics Please. for the time yeah, lag. That's right. So do the Br British uh, law, do you have more of a philosophical reflection on this? Because this is, uh, it's, it's such a gigantic contradiction and it doesn't seem to bother the lawyers at all. I, I, first of all, agree with your analysis. I think you're correct. There is a contradiction. Let me explain why I think it's been resolved in the way it has. I think it's by learning. And for us, I think the decision in Miller, which was the case where the court was asked, should a UK parliament be asked, to be an act of parliament, for us to Brexit. And the first panel was headed by Lord Justice Thomas. And he was left with the unenviable task of telling the government that they had to have legislation. He did it with the knowledge that behind him lay the independence of the judiciary, which was not defined by the rule of law alone, but by the fact that his human rights were protected as a judge. And that's a very strange thing to say, but it's that point that the judges have suddenly realized that they are also public servants. They are public servants. How, why is that important? That's a really strange answer to give you. Because they have been identified, like all the public sector, as wasteful, inefficient, and all the rest of it. We just are no good. You'd be much better if you were a private sector. And every attempt to make court fees full fees only makes it clearer how distinct the public sector must be to protect that entity we describe as judicial. So by all sorts of, if you like, uh, uh, not intuitive thinking, the judges have suddenly realized that they too need human rights in order to preserve the essence of what they used to take for granted. Status, which was the bedrock of what they did, is no longer there. So I think that there are still skeptics and there are still those who are arguing about do judges make political decisions and it's going too far. And there's a right of center backlash, without doubt. The, 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 the scholarly uh, academy is not immune to this. But I do think there's a middle round which has the majority view that we have learned the benefits and they will continue. And I would say that the majority in the Supreme Court will support whatever happens after Brexit by continually incorporating the ideas from the Court of Justice, both in Strasbourg and Luxembourg. It will not end, because I think we realize the need, the necessity to have this, to counteract the simple positivist law, which is simply inadequate to the task. Paulus and then Marcelo. Thank you. You referred to the South African Constitution yes. of 1996, and immediately some of my frustrations came in. And this is in particular with regard to citizen-state relations where social exclusion is an issue. Now, in the first instance, the laws are set by the elite, the representative elite, and law the judiciary is there as an appeal body by citizens where they feel aggrieved. 
But in the process, there is also the question of boundaries. Take, for instance, when the Constitutional Court in South Africa pronounces the president has violated the Constitution, but leaves it to Parliament to deal with the issue. And it is, I mean, Parliament and the president belong to the same board. They belong to the same social base. He is there because Parliament put him there. And where does this leave the, the citizen when we are told at times that law, the courts can legislate through precedents? Can they not seize upon this notion of precedence then to go beyond parliament and say, it is now in our domain. The hmm. very instance that it has come here, it's because you were incompetent in dealing with it. Yeah. Thank, you. No, thank you for that. Um, I, I wrote an article a few years ago in the South African Law Journal which addresses your question by looking at the key issue, which is this. Should the judiciary substitute the inadequacies of the political system by filling the gap? And I'll be honest, it is a difficult question to answer correctly. You can give many good answers which represent both sides of the argument, at the heart of the debate is the question of elevating, going back to your earlier question, the notion of pedagogy, the notion of justice, and how you put that into a judicial form that overcomes the representative democracy. You could argue the representative democracy is flawed in, and therefore is not adequate to the task. This, the, 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 the moment that that happens, is very dangerous for judges because it moves the discussion from the nature of judicial power to the appointment of judicial power. And it goes around in a circle. So my conclusion was that it has to be at a period of transition to at least allow the democratic system a period to try to incorporate what it ought to do in terms of the rule of law before the tipping point is reached that the judges is substitute for the democratic process. Now, you could be right, and I am wrong, that you may argue the tipping point has been passed, and therefore the judges should do it. I concede the point. But when I wrote the article, I did not think we had reached that stage. But I think it's a very, very dangerous stage, because as you know, uh, Madsen Mabutu and Lardner Park in uh, Rhodesia, the judges then had to resign in the end, when it was you know, they're not able to hold sway. In Venezuela, that was the case. Thank you. Marcelo. Now, I want to ask a uh, particular thing that uh, today become important because it's the application to do Pope Francis with the question of Amoris Laetitia. That is the, the virtue of Epikeia, the idea of Epikeia is present in, in the common law in some sense? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have more this idea in all the no. positivist law, uh, both uh, in, 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 in Latin system yeah. and on Anglo-Saxon system. It, it is, it is a, the problem of language is the interpretation of it, and it, t it takes some time to understand. Um, we have a, a different vocabulary which we borrow from the equitable courts in terms of trust. Uh, trust is a, is a concept that is used to mitigate the disasters of the common law, and for medieval time this was the development. So you could argue that what Pope Francis is looking at is this notion of equity or trust that comes with fellowship. And therefore, in a fellowship, there are rules that are binding that fellowship together, breach of which is a violation of the trust. Um, that's a very Anglo-Saxon way of translating a much more complicated concept. But I have to think more about it because it, it, it requires me to think about how best to explain what is really quite a complicated doctrine. So it's not a very good answer, but it's the best <laughs> at the moment. Thank you. Uh, John, I have, since there is nobody else, I let me allow to pose the question. You know, in the American tradition, legal tradition, there are two, in recent times, two schools of thought. One is associated to the name of Holmes, yep. who starts from the assumption of the bad man. 
yes. which is the analogous to the home economicus yep. in economics, exactly similar. The other one is due to Brandeis. Yep. The Brandeis tradition, on the other hand, stresses the pedagogical, uh, what Paolo Carozza said yes, before, yes. etc. Now, in recent times, uh, Lynn Stout, she's a professor, she published this book called uh, uh, Good Laws Make Good People. Uh, I found it very fascinating that she's professor of law, uh, I believe, in Harvard or yes. Princeton, perhaps okay. it's Princeton. Now, my question then to you is, uh, do you give emphasis to the notion of expressive laws? which is a new notion introduced in the states in the last 10, 15 years, according to which uh, legal norms are supposed to be congruent with the social norms and the moral norms of the society to which uh, the legal norms uh, have to be applied. What do you think about uh, the future of expressive laws? Thank you. I think if I'm answering as an English lawyer, I would not recognize it very easily. But in the context of Northern Ireland, I recognize it completely because it's exactly what the Northern Ireland architecture is about. It's an expressive way of getting the majority and the minority to agree to govern under a set of par parameters which are at the heart human rights based. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond what the letter of the law says in terms of the facilities which are quasi-legal but are structured in a way to facilitate. In other words, you get more carrots if you agree uh, than if you don't agree. It's not a legal test, but it's a practical application of it. And that's a very, very unusual set of circumstances. And it's an experiment which not everyone agrees, and it may not work because it's very sophisticated in terms of the norm of what the common law is. I think I'd say this. The influences you're, you talk about are very difficult to locate in a system that still puts so much emphasis on the politics of the law in the political system of parliament. That's the problem. Uh, it, it's still that dynamic that restrains the legal discourse, I think, except for the critical legal studies stuff, which is, you know, in a sense, in a, different, in a different vernacular, having a different conversation. It doesn't enter the mainstream in the way that you and I are discussing. So there's a frustration, I think, about the pedagogically bereft <laughs> not reaching the stage that the American lawyers have reached because we haven't the toolbox to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's exactly four, half past four, and this is the time for, oh, you have the last time, sorry. There is a last question, please. Comment and then John, your response. I can see between what you and Vittorio were doing together, all sorts of very recognizable elements of our cultural, political, legal inheritance from the 18th century and even before. I, but there's one that's a creature of the 18th century that seems to me has shown up in our, your Brexit and our Trump election that is swollen beyond any power imaginable. It's Rupert Murdoch. In other words, how do you evaluate? I know it's a big question, but hasn't this become a, the power of public opinion? It arises during the Enlightenment as virtually a fourth estate. Uh, what do we do? Yeah. You, yes, so you're the elegant lawyer. What do you do with it? What this? do we do? Um, you know, your question is so helpful because it goes to the root of a problem. It used to be I would read the Financial Times or the Guardian to understand what was happening or the Daily Telegraph or whatever. But the trouble is that the news is now so managed that it's no longer reliable. So my answer in part is to see the alternative, which is emerging. And I think it's because of what you say about Rupert Murdoch's influence and the contamination of both political parties and the media, that we now look more to uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the reports done by independent bodies, uh, some private, some public, uh, including the House of Commons. And, and that's where we are. In other words, it's better to read a House of Commons library paper than it is to read a newspaper. That's a very depressing thought if you think about it. <laughs> because the one's written in English and the other's, you know. 
Thank you. But I, I, I think you're putting a, a, a really important moral issue about what do we do about this. And you know, I don't think people, uh, Margaret can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we really have faced up to it. it I think we're still in shock, to be blunt, uh, over the last, uh, the last year. I think we're, we're still looking, you know, what's happened? Why? It, we're still a little bit befuddled by it. But it is a very, very, very important question for the future of all our democracies. Thank you.